we're undergoing some massive changes here at the Field Museum in the next year, thanks to a generous donation from the Kenneth C. Griffin Charitable Fund. Among other things, we're relocating and updating the pose of our star T-Rex, Sue, to reflect new research on these animals. T-Rexes have a set of belly ribs called gastralia, but nobody could quite figure out how they were supposed to articulate with the rest of the skeleton. Now we know, so instead of looking like this, we think T-Rexes looked a little bit more like this. And that got me thinking a lot about how important art is to our understanding of prehistoric life, as well as the artists who have worked here at the Field Museum over the years. But digging up information about our past artists in geology was no simple feat. I contacted partner museums from around the United States and Europe, sought out family members of the artists, and scoured our archives for information and personnel records. I made use of more interlibrary loan requests than any other time in my life. The work from these artists touched millions of people, yet the information about two of the three was virtually unknown, and I wanted to change that. So without further ado, I bring you the Field Museum's Artists of Prehistory. One of the first prehistoric artists the Field Museum hired was Charles Knight. He's also by far the best known. Numerous books and galleries have been devoted to his life's work and talents. Part of the realism in his studies came from his observations of animals in life. He spent a lot of time at zoos observing and drawing the animals. And when it came to painting the prehistoric, Knight went to great lengths to create three-dimensional models of his subjects, which he then would take outside to see how the sunlight played off of their features. Between 1927 and 1931, Knight was commissioned by the Field Museum to create 28 gigantic murals to chronicle life on Earth, which would line the walls in our new Hall of Fossil Vertebrates. They'd become his most iconic series, with a few standouts like T-Rex vs. Triceratops, which inspired numerous artists and filmmakers at the time, like The Lost World and the scene in Fantasia where the T-Rex was going after the Stegosaurus, even though they lived 84 million years apart, but Anyway, one of the most incredible things about Knight's literally massive accomplishments was that he was legally blind. When he was six, he was hit in one eye with rock, sustaining permanent corneal damage, and later developed an astigmatism in the other. So the murals for the field were completed with his left eye just inches from the canvas. But what I love about Knight's paintings is how he was able to artfully convey the passage of time. The majority of his works are still on display in our Evolving Planet exhibition. And if you look at the murals in sequence, ranging from the oldest scenes to the newest, you'll notice that the images become clearer over time. The more ancient the subject, the hazier the memory, until everything comes into sharp focus with bolder colors in the Pleistocene. Among Knight's admirers was author Ray Bradbury, who said, When we think of these beasts, these monsters, that lived in the world for so many hundreds of thousands of years and then vanished, and we think we're going to be here for a long time, well, if the dinosaurs could vanish from the world, we have to be careful with ourselves. But when you do excellent things, you live forever. So the work that Charles R. Knight did, it's there forever, and it's going to stay forever. Knight was followed by two other artists who were ultimately much less recognized but similarly talented, each with their own unique personal story and style. The first was John Conrad Hansen, who was chronically shy and somewhat of an enigma. Having immigrated to the United States from Trondheim, Norway when he was just 12, he lived with his mother in Minneapolis until her death in 1928, when he was 59. In the following years, he moved around, eventually making his way to Chicago, where he worked for a calendar company and painted church altarpieces. Then, at an age when most people are settling into retirement, Hansen decided on a second career. He contacted the field in 1940 and was hired as an artist when he was 71. And what's truly intriguing about his role of paleo artist is that he didn't believe these extinct creatures had lived. Hansen's religious convictions and his belief in the great biblical flood didn't mesh with the animals he was painting here, and so he referred to them simply as the object. In spite of that, his imagination in depicting ancient animals was world-class, and many of his paintings hung with the articulated skeletons in the fossil hall for many years. He worked for the field until a month before his death in 1952, at the age of 84. Shortly before Conrad Hansen's death, another artist was hired by the geology department. Mighty Wiebe was born in Germany in 1922, but not much about her early life is known, even to her family. She grew up during the most vicious years of World War II and undoubtedly was impacted by the experience. While her family certainly endured hardships, they were lucky to be German. She was able to pursue a university education in Poland in 1943, but was interrupted toward the end of the war as the Soviet army approached their town. Mighty and her family were evacuated with other German refugees 
refugees. And after the war in 1946, she re-enrolled at the University of Frankfurt, determined to study art. Wiebe had a sense of independence that was still pretty unusual for women at that time. In 1951, she departed for Chicago, and later that year was hired enthusiastically by curators at the Field Museum, who recognized her talents as an exceptional naturalist and artist. She created figures for scientific papers, illustrated a number of children's books, carried on Hansen's work painting prehistoric life, and created scale models to accompany the mounted skeletons on display. Some of her work can still be seen around the museum today, especially in the geology cases on the second floor, where she illustrated geologic phenomena, including impact craters from meteorites. And it's in these photographs of her, looking so poised and polished, but painting scenes of epic destruction, that first piqued my interest in learning more about her. One of Wiebe's biggest projects was designing and modeling new dinosaurs for display in our main hall, a Gorgosaurus, which came to be known as Gorgeous George, in the middle of eating a Lambiosaurus. When it was unveiled in 1956, Gorgeous George was the first freestanding dinosaur mount in any museum. Eugene Richardson, who was the curator of fossil invertebrates, found it so remarkable that he wrote a poem about it, which was delivered upon its unveiling to the public. Mighty's illustrations and models played a big part in breathing life into the project, and her miniatures were on display next to the mounted skeletons until they were eventually removed from the hall in 1990. The dinosaur skeletons were remounted to display a more modern anatomical understanding and are still on display in our Evolving Planet exhibition. Mighty's work continued until 1962, when she left the museum at the age of 40, but she carried a love of art in the natural world throughout the rest of her life. Many things have changed in the years since the field first commissioned these artists to help tell the story of life on Earth. New research is regularly reshaping the way we interpret extinct life forms, and today, while we might not point to Knight's or Weeby's depictions of Cretaceous apex predators as the most modern representations of them, that doesn't mean their art has lost its value. It's through the work of these artists that researchers were best able to communicate the progress of science and bring our ancient world back to life. Come and see the Gorgosaurus, tall as life, though somewhat thinner, standing in the hall before us and erupted in his dinner. Hundred million years ago, he found a Lambiosaur to munch on. Something stopped his feast, and so he never had that final luncheon. Long ago, the date Cretaceous, Gorgosaurus roamed Alberta, ever hungry, fierce, voracious, seeking smaller prey to murder. Then he died, became a fossil buried near the Red Deer River, passed the years asleep and docile, giving not a jerk or quiver. Found and shipped to the museum with that meal he never tasted, here he stands and here you see him, not a bone on him was wasted. Other skeletons of his bulk must be held erect by crutches, not a post is seen on this hulk, just the floor is all he touches. Engineers may be well baffled by the structure we're reporting, here he stands without a scaffold. Gorgosaur is self-supporting. It still has brains on it.